How do many CONCACAF nations make the away games tough? How do you become a professional soccer coach in the United States? And how does a national team prepare to face another national team from a tactical standpoint? Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo, and welcome to Tactical Manager TV, and welcome to an exclusive interview with Gerson Perez. And Gerson is the son of Hugo Perez, and Gerson is also the assistant coach for El Salvador's national team and the head coach for El Salvador's U20s. So yeah, in this interview, we're going to talk a lot about CONCACAF World Cup qualifying. Gerson will be talking about what strategy and what tactics El Salvador used to hold the United States for a 0-0 draw at El Salvador during World Cup qualifying, how they got the 1-0 loss, which he talks about that, if it was a good or a bad result from his standpoint, youth development, how he became a coach, how he got the U.S. licenses, how he got started, his dad also, Hugo Perez, and much more, including how to recruit dual nationals. I would also like to give a special thank you to Jay Hernandez for helping this interview happen. Make sure to follow Jackson Perez and Jay Hernandez on Twitter. And don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this type of content. I won't be requesting during the interview. I know it's long, but trust me, this is one of the best interviews we've ever had in this channel. So sit back, relax, get some popcorn, and let's get it started. All right, so today here at the channel, we have a very special guest. I'm actually very excited for this episode because I've brought a lot of players that are playing and pundits. I never brought an active coach. And not that I, if I did, I, I'm, I apologize, but I don't remember at least. So today we have Gerson Perez, the coach of the El Salvador U20s, the assistant coach of El Salvador's senior squad, and son of a U.S. men's national team legend, Hugo Perez. Gerson. Thank you very much for coming to the channel. No, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I think in the Twitter world, you see so much stuff. I think I've, I've probably seen a lot of your stuff uh, here and there. And uh, I think, you know, always uh, growing up, obviously, in the U.S., you follow the U.S. team. So, you know, always connected with that in some shape or form. Yeah. Hopefully you didn't see too many crazy stuff because I do go a little crazy on Twitter as a as a USA fan at times. But <laughs> no, no, I think I think, I, you know, I think everybody enjoys reading different things, different perspectives. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, I think that's what Twitter is for. Right. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody gets to say it. And that's the kind of the beauty of it. It's what soccer needs. It's passion and fans debating. At the end of the day, it's just opinions. No one's right. No one's wrong. It's whatever happens in the game is what really matters. So but that's what it's about. But before we start a lot of topics that I want to cover here, uh, could you quickly just tell a little bit about yourself to the, to the viewers here? Um, you grew up in the U.S., as you said there already, and you do coach the U-20 level. You do have your coaching badges as well. Um, could you quickly just go through that where you grew up, why you became a coach very quickly? Yeah, yeah. I grew up in the U.S. Um, you know, back in the day, the U.S. national team players short lived contracts one year, two years, maybe, um, you know, still trying to make a dent in the European scene or the world scene as an American. So, you know, I grew up in I lived in France. I lived in Sweden. I lived in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then finally, I lived a couple of years in El Salvador where my dad retired. So, you know, always lived in football countries, um, you know, played soccer, you know, everywhere I could. I think, you know, nothing like nowadays where there's academies, where there's development, where, you know, kids have a chance to, to succeed. I think, you know, as a family, you know, with, with a grandpa that played, a, a great grandpa that played, a, uncles that played, cousins that all played professional, you know, you grow up almost with an expectation that you're going to play professional or you have to play professional. Um, so I think all of us, you know, born with, with talent, I would say to a certain extent, but I think uh, a lot different for us growing up where we're always moving where you know we're not settled um so we don't get to pursue a, a, a soccer career the same way um so i think all of that kind of plays a role in, you know when i when i get to you know 18 years old going to college uh you know trying to play there you know game was 
was a little fast for me. You know, I, I wasn't used to the speed at, at which it was being played. Um, you know, I think you can only survive. I think you, you come from a Central American background where they tell you, you know, as long as you're technical, you you can survive. And, and I think my maybe my generation um, is, is one of the last ones where you're not going to survive just with that anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think I quickly realized I, I needed I, and I say needed, I needed to stay in the game. You know, I, I was, uh, you wanted you know, to, I, right? Yourself, yeah, you wanted. just passionate. You know, I, I thought I was going to make it. And, and now I'm, I'm quickly realizing that I don't have the talent, um, to do it. And, uh, so I started coaching, you know, 18, 19 years old, whatever I could, I, I you know, I would shadow coaches, you know, I'd shadow my dad. He was starting to, to coach as well. So I would go watch. Uh, I'd go pick up cones, give out pennies, um, you know, sit on the sidelines, you know, growing up also, you know, I had access obviously to, to a few professional coaches. So I would ask, Hey, can I go watch a session here, pick up things, uh, you know, read. And in the mean, and, you know, at the same time doing licenses, you know, starting from grassroots license, D license, E license, F license, whatever you could get your hands on. Um, so I think at a young age, I think by 22, I had my B license, uh, you know, graduating college. I was coaching, uh, you know, studying in the morning and then coaching in the afternoon. Uh, you know, I maybe skipped the, the part of the college life where you you enjoy. It was I wanted to be in the game, you know, uh, still playing on the weekends, you know, making 250 a game, whatever I could make on the side. But still, you know, coaching as much as I could. So I think that's that's kind of what started it. And then, uh, you know, by that time, I think my dad's already, you know, involved with youth national teams um, you know, as an assistant, uh, you know, at different levels. And, um, you know, obviously he traveled a lot. So he'd come back and I'd ask, hey, you know, can I get a copy of the sessions you guys did? I want to see them. Um, you know, so I'd get copies of what, you know, Tab Ramos is doing, you know, copies of what Thomas Rungan's doing. And, you know, I'm, I'm basically collecting as much information, learning, putting it to practice. And um, I start doing it more. Um, you know, I, I, I thought out of college I would have to find a job and coach on the side. And luckily, you know, I was able to, to stay making a living off of it to, to keep um, keep at it, keep perfecting it. And it's in that time that, you know, U.S. soccer is starting to, to, to boost up the development academy um you know starting to look for coaches is with coaches with licenses uh who would take up projects would be able to you know work with them in player development so you know i took as much as i could uh you know spoke to clubs saying look i i have a b license i'm, I'm trying to work with, towards my a license i want to be in the development academy you know i want to be coaching at that level uh also i started u14 u16 u18 um all the way to the point where you know i became uh the academy we had running in, in close to San Francisco, you know, I became an academy director there. Uh, U.S. Soccer opened up, you know, after I got my A license, they opened up an academy director license for, for coaches that had, had already received the A license. Uh, so it's through that that, you know, I'm able to kind of grow up in the in the world where, you know, Pulisic is developing, you know, the way uh, you know, Haji Wright, all these guys that that made it right. Um, I like that you mentioned Haji right right now because he's been scoring now every week. No, I, I did, but you know, but it, you know, he was kind of blowing up. Obviously, my cousin Josh, you know, played with Pulisic, Tyler Adams, you know, Eric Calvillo, who's with us now. Um, all, you know, all these guys that 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 are blowing up, Tadagui, you know. Um, so, you know, they they sort of came from this, I think, good uh, process that the U.S. started, which was develop the coach. <laughs> and those coaches will develop players, right? So it's it's a pretty simple formula. So I think you know me doing as much as I could with with U.S. Soccer licenses, whatever I could do, just the networking, seeing what what other coaches were doing, you know, from other MLS clubs, European clubs. Uh, I learned a lot, right? So I think it's what I needed to to develop as a coach, uh, as a person, um, and I think. You know, last year it comes full circle. Uh, you know, my dad ends up taking the national team. I'm working with academies, MLS Next. Uh, you know, and I told him, I said, look, I think, uh, you know, last time you were in the youth national team set up, you know, you brought in different assistants, different guys you wanted to try. And I, I told him, I think um, 
I think it's better if, if, if I come in and I told him I'll leave what I'm doing. Uh, but I, I, you know, I said, you know, I think as a, as a head coach, you, you have to be very comfortable with your staff and you have to really understand, or they have to understand you. And I think, you know, I told them, you know, I, I think it's something that I need to do. And I think it's something that you need. I told them, so, you know, we'll make it work. Right. So we were both running an Academy. We gave the Academy to, to a different club, to different coaches. We left it completely. And it's what started this, this process last June. Um, and it's, it's been great. So that, that's how we got here. Yeah, that's great. And also just to point out one thing that you mentioned, a lot of the times people ask me um, here at the channel or, or emails, messages on Instagram, it's like, Filippo, how do I, I want to get involved with soccer, but I'm, I, I, I'm not good enough to play, but I want to work with it. Um, yeah. And uh, you pretty much just responded to that. It's like, if you want to be with soccer and you can't be a player because that requires a talent, maybe that would be a way to put it, uh, get involved. Get involved. Like you said, you were picking up cones. You were just getting involved. And if you don't want to be a coach, you want to wor work in marketing. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Get involved. I I got just the grassroots license, right? The very first one because I needed because I worked here with Orlando City in their first soccer schools when they were opening up la before the pandemic, actually. And then yeah. after yeah. I worked too. But the only reason I got invited to that was because I was always just involved with a bunch of soccer people. That's, that's essentially the secret. And obviously work hard too you're not it's not going to fall on your lap but get involved that i think that's the best no, advice. That, look, that, that's the key and uh, you know nobody knows I, I was a sports a business management major i thought i was going to get a master's in sports management and i you know i said i need to stay involved in in any way i can but i you know i think today i read something um you know about what the coaches and academies and youth coaches do and you know if people want to coach i think you know, there's a lot of good youth coaches out there that get overlooked, but you know, the amount of work you see done by the youth coaches, you know, seven days a week, uh, licenses, programs, uh, you know, everything they have to go through, I think is a big learning process. Like you said, it, I think it's a good way to stay connected in the game and, and, and do your part. Mm -hmm. So Jackson, um, I want to go through one thing here, uh, right now, and then we're going to go back to the U20s. But first I want to talk about the senior squads right because you work as an assistant with your dad you're there with them the day-to-day -day throughout world cup qualifying so you live through an entire world cup qualifying cycle right there with el salvador and it, it was a team that we clearly saw it is well coached and i'm not saying this because you're here okay i've been i've said this before in the channel and everyone in the channel here's a witness many others have said because uh for example when el salvador faces the united states uh, and I apologize for it, but there is a, a talent gap in terms of players. The United States has more players in bigger leagues getting this experience. And you talked about some names there that you mentioned, Pulisic, Weah, Tyler. Uh, but El Salvador in both games didn't seem like the lesser team. It seemed very balanced. It was 0-0 at El Salvador, and it was only 1-0 in the United States. And I do have a question. I don't know how much you can dive into this. Um from the way Greg plays the United States, what was essentially the game plan coming from you and your dad to face the United States? What were you all looking into weaknesses to exploit as much as you can dive into it? Obviously, you don't want to give it all away, especially because you're going to face the, the You're going to play the United States yeah, I know. <laughs> in June. So you can't talk too much. But in those games specifically, those games that already went by. What was the game plan there, uh, or at least part of it? Even though by now, probably you guys and Greg already know what happened. Look, I, I think you know we we after Gold Cup, um, we 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 had a couple ideas. Obviously, we marked it in the calendar, right? In the summer, we said, okay, we're opening against the U.S. I think we find out really fast in June after we qualify. So, I think one knowing that you're playing, you know, players who are superior athletes um you know good on the ball good in transition i think the first game we wanted to control mi the midfield i think that that's what we said at home we'll control the midfield uh field is not bad in september it's not bad when we play but i know that the players coming from europe are not going to like the the type of grass right it, it isn't a, a smooth grass it eats your legs. It could eat your legs. It could be. We we always ask for it to be very short, but the kind of grass it is, it, it always stays kind of thick. Um, so we ask to water it because we want to speed it up. Uh, but 
you know, a player that hasn't played on it. And we have, you know, we had guys debut on that field too in September. Um, you know, it could be heavy. So we said, you know, if we can control the midfield, control a little bit of possession, you know, take the ball away from them as much as we can, uh, you know, then I think we have a chance, right? That was the first thing. And then second, you know, we said, you know, not let Tyler control the game as much, you know, see if we could kind of keep it. So I think that game we go in a, in a 4-4-2 diamond. Um, and, you know, we had kind of saved it. We had done it in Croatia in, in, in July or June. Uh, we worked on it a, a couple of times, but, you know, we kind of thought we'll save it for kind of an important match. We didn't use it at Gold Cup. Um, but look, at the end, I think, you know, systems change a lot. But at the end, we wanted to do one thing was control a little bit of the midfield and, uh, you know, see if we use our, our strength, which is, you know, our right back is very good. The Macas, uh, you know, see if we can get them involved. And then uh, our midfield, too, is, is, I think, you know, good ball winners, uh, you know, can combine. Haido, if you leave them up top in a 1v1, you know, we said if we can we can pin the center backs 2v2, um, we know Serginho Dest is going to attack. And we know Yedlin likes to fly, right? We know Yedlin mm -hmm. wants to fly and he wants to get up and he relies a lot on his athleticism to track back. You know, we thought we, we would find good situations to be too. Um, and, and I think we did, we found that the first game. So that was kind of a little bit of the plan. The second game, you know, we, we wanted to go three, four, three for, for a while. I think, you know, we, we talked a lot of during the Christmas break, a lot about doing a three, four, three coming into the camp doing uh, a lot of three four three work um, in January. You know, we were able to do it. Uh, you know, funny thing is, is you know, we're we're training, we're having to train in, in Indiana and in Ohio to get used to the cold. And uh, there must have been, you know, a couple people recording a lot of our training sessions. You know, coming into the indoor. It wasn't career. me, okay. I can assure I, you. I, <laughs> I don't know who it was, but, you know, a couple of people we looked and they were videoing. So, you know, we played in the 11, we played in Academy and, and we had to use it. So I think by that time we knew the U.S. knew we were going to go 3-4-3 three, three, and it just so happened, you know, we had, you know, visa problem, a couple of key injuries in the back. So we ended up going back into 4-3-3, three, three, you know, same thing we did in Gold Cup. But again, I, I think for us it was kind of limiting what the U.S. would do. Um and having them beat us by what we thought was an acceptable way to lose, which was for us, it was let Anthony Robinson, you know, beat us, um, you know, have him make decisions on the ball and, uh, you know, see if, if, you know, how many times he would combine in the midfield and, uh, you know, he scored, right? So game plan was that we, we, we live and die by, by the game plan. It cost us, but, you know, I think we it was just making things a little bit more predictable, taking away, you know, Craig's inverted runs or wing progression, I think that they call it, um, you know, trying to take that piece away as much as we could. But at the end of the day, you know, Pulisic is, is you have to surround them with numbers and hope he can play quick, um, you know, see if you can get on him before he turns. Yeah, they're, they're just good players, right? You know, Ferreira coming in as a false nine, you know, created a lot of, problems for us in between lines uh i think we were you know not expecting him i think we expected pepe to start that game mm -hmm. um but you know him coming in kind of changed it gave us a little bit of problems uh but you know at the end of the day i think when you play a good team you you, you just kind of have to pick what you want to lose by um and, and then limit it to that and then to the players in the little time you have is is just explain to them clearly what the u.s right or what the team's going to do and when they get to the game, it's not a surprise. It's okay. This is what they're doing. These are the runs they make. This is what this guy likes to do. And then you, you got to play. You got to play. And, um, you know, we wanted to go 0-0 up until maybe 70, 75th minute and then make a couple offensive changes, see if we could steal something, steal the point. Um, but I, I think we give up a goal in the 62nd minute or something like that. So it kind of changed it. But, like, the U.S. is a good team. And, and they they know what exactly what they do. They do it fast. Uh you know, it's very clear how they, they set up in zone one, zone two, zone three. Um, it's hard to stop, right? The, the speed they have, you know, Anthony's 
flies up and down that that wing you know for a second there you lose him he's, he's in behind you most attacks um, are just on the flanks though for the u.s i see that pattern quite a bit we attack a lot through the sides and we don't create much through the middle um for the most part but i see what you're saying that too my, my only I, I, there was one point you brought up there. Sorry to interrupt on that, Justin, but it's just you, you yeah. mentioned Pulisic on the turn. You want to like having guys surround him. So I saw throughout World Cup qualifying, there were games where Pulisic struggled. Um, we saw that quite a bit, actually. Maybe more than U.S. men's national team fans are comfortable with, right? We never want our golden yeah. boy to be struggling. Do you think that maybe Pulisic struggled because many teams had that approach of not letting him have much time and surround him? And him being on the field, that probably opens up space for other players. Would you agree with that? He's always a focal point. Um, and, and, you know, the biggest fear you have with, with Christian is is if he beats that first defender, he, he'll start to unbalance everything, right? Because then people have to get out of position and cover. Um, so... Look, it is. You, you, I think it, it can affect, but I also think he ha he's had games where, you know, he does the little things right as well. Um, you know, I think in an interview he did say he was trying to do a lot, and I think um, that was that played a little bit of a role. I think, you know, when he comes in, he he wants to make the difference right away. Um, but you know, he commands so much attention, uh, and he's so quick. You know, on 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 a ball he gets on a half turn. You know, it's almost a guarantee that he's going to get by the first guy. And and I think that is something that you just have to keep an eye on. Um, but, you know, I think he does his role well. I, I think if he drops a little bit too much into midfield, I think you lose a little bit of what he can give you in that final third mm -hmm. or in between lines. Uh, and I think a lot of the games we saw, you know, he was coming in deep to pick up a ball, um, which I, I think most teams will be happy with that if he's, if he's receiving next to Tyler you know he's not going to hurt you as bad as if he's receiving you know 1v1 on your center back or, or on your defensive mid so I, I think it's just something that um you know yeah mexico game he comes in he makes he makes a difference right away right he's mm -hmm. near the box so you know i think it's probably just a, a a decision thing for him but but he he can be impactful when he wants i, I mean yeah. he, he can change the game in in, in a second yeah, especially in the final third. You leave it in the final third, that's where you don't want him getting the ball towards the, the back line. So yeah. moving on from that, because we talked a little bit about World Cup qualifying, uh, I, I do still think El Salvador with everything, because I've heard you talk in the past at Twitter Spaces about the overall struggle of... of it, it's just that El Salvador doesn't have the same resources as a U.S. Soccer Federation or Mexican Federation has in all those struggles and you still pulled off a 0-0 draw and you made the U.S. really fight for that 1-0 win at home. Uh, moving on from World Cup qualifying, because I think that was the main focal point I wanted to do, El Salvador, you coach the U-20s and there's a very big U-20 tournament coming up over the summer. Uh, I, I personally think it's very big because it qualifies to the U-20 World Cup and to the Olympics. Yep. So to me, that's massive. Uh, we need to qualify for U.S. soccer. And you're currently in a U-20 tournament with El Salvador U-20s. I know the United States U-20 was in Argentina um, two, three weeks ago, I believe. They had some friendlies. Yeah. What's the what's so you're living this U-20 cycle? What what are you what are you seeing right now with El Salvador, United States, Mexico? If if you know much about the United States U-20. Is this a team that you see qualifying to the Olympics or we're going to continue to shrug? Because we haven't qualified the past three cycles. Um, what, what's going on in the U-20 level? Because I'm in CONCACAF because it's hard for us to get information there. Look, it, 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 U.S., Mexico are always going to be you know, full of, of players, especially now the U.S. Um, the team they have, I think they, they, they tied Argentina. They beat, uh, I think it was River. Played, mm -hmm. Probably 5-3, mm -hmm. I think it was um so you know we're we're aware of, of you know what they're doing mikey you know mikey's from northern california um lucci's assistant obviously with fc dallas mikey um, is the, just so everyone watching mikey's the current u20 coach mikey Varas. but yeah mikey Varas was the sac republic um you know coached academy games against me a lot um so you know i, I know i know mikey i know you know He's very methodical, um, you know, very, very orient, uh, detail oriented. So, you know, I think he'll do a, a good job with that group. But, 
you know, the, the talent that the U.S. has or the guys that are abroad, you know, the guys that are, are getting consistent MLS minutes, I think separates them, right? Even Mexico, um, you know, might have a few younger guys that are probably struggling to get minutes in the league as well. I think that 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 could be playing a big difference in, in what's happening in Mexico. But I think the U.S., you know, with the guys they have, I think they have a group that that you know can can win a, a youth World Cup, not just qualify for things or or you know compete well in the Olympics. I, I think they, they you know the talent is there, um, and you know with El Salvador right now, you know it, it's kind of we're looking at a lot of American uh, Salvadorian talent, right? Salvadorian players born in, in the U.S. You know guys that are in MLS MLS academies. You know, it, it's still different, right? It's different. It's different having a, you know, a player that, that gets loaned out to a USL club to get minutes versus, you know, a Cade Cowell who's who's playing a lot uh, at, the, at the San Jose Earthquakes, right? A, a Caden Clark. Um, so, you know, it, there's a difference, right, in terms of what, what those players are doing. So I think our job in, in El Salvador is to make sure we can prepare them as much as we can together. I think uh, there's, there's always a... A, a good differentiating factor when at least the team trains together a little bit more because uh, there's an understanding there's a certain chemistry that builds there's a bond that builds with the players uh national team duty is tough because you don't have the players every day right so you know we've been in El Salvador working at least with the local player you know two days a week trying to bring them in Tuesday Wednesdays to to do some training play a quick uh friendly um but you know the challenge for us now is we're at a tournament right now we have 11 uh players from the u.s uh and eight players from from el salvador and we you know we did it on purpose you know one it's easier to get the u.s player to come here um but two is you know how do we integrate that group how do they compete i think still the 0304 category in the u.s is one of the early categories in, in the u.s soccer development pyramid so i don't think you're going to see the amount of talent you're going to see from an 06, 07, 08 age group that's coming out of the U.S. Uh, I think those players now, the younger ones, have a lot more resources. You know, I'm in Dallas right now. There's a GA Cup here, right? U15, 17. You have River Play, Flamengo, uh, Manchester United here. So, you know, the the 03, 04 class didn't get that, right? They didn't play those games. So, I, you know, you you're, you're going to see a, a very marked difference in the development. But I think the challenge for us is. How do we compete against, you know, players that are playing at this elite level on a weekly basis? Um, you know, you yeah, you just have to make sure one, you lay a good foundation for the team. You you kind of clearly um, describe or or make it as clear as possible what your concepts are and what your go tos are. Right? What are your constants? We call them constants. Right? This is our team's constant. Right? This is what we look for. In times of trouble, this is when we're not sure what's going on. This is what we look for. And then the other thing I look for is also the coaching, you know, from an MLS side, who's coaching it, right? I, I think that's a big difference for me when I pick a player. It's, you know, what does he work on, right? If, the, if I know the coach, is it more of a possession-oriented game? Is it more of a transitional game? Because some MLS academies will play you differently, right? Um, so you have to kind of understand that if you're bringing a talented player, he has to fit in with, you know what you're trying to to build as a coach uh and then you know you go to the, Sal the salvador side you have to put in that work two days three days a week as much as you can because they're not going to get that at a club level uh you know that there's no at the moment there, you know i would there's no youth academy there isn't a U u15 u16 u17 growing up in el salvador it's there's a reserve league and third division second division and and it's a sur it's survival mode um and when you're in that kind of competitive environment you, i think what you see from the salvadorian player is we can play the us right in cuscatlan and tie zero zero because he he has a lot of heart uh he, he can compete individually he's grown up in, in in a terrible terrible you know conditions and 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 you have this fighting mentality and you have to you know we have to be able to use that um to our advantage uh but at the same time like i said that could also lead to to you go watch a second division game. It's just kick, run, fight, kick, run, fight, and, and there's very little work done, right? So when they come in, we have to kind of do a lot of concept work, constant. But I think you know to kind of go back to your question, I think the U.S. has enough to to not just get you know make an Olympic uh, 
you know, Olympics, they, they, they have enough to, to win if they want to. I, I love to hear that. But one thing that caught my attention when you were talking about, it looks like in this U20 level, one thing that can play a big role on the success of a U20 team and not or not is minutes as a professional, right? Because when you get in the U20 level, some players are just still academy players and some are getting professional minutes, playing with grown men. So you mentioned, for yeah. example, Caden Clark and Kay Cow, they're getting consistent minutes in MLS. If I'm not mistaken, the U.S. team, uh, almost every player in the U20 is in one way, shape, or form in a professional team, either in USL or in MLS. Your El Salvador squad, are most players academy or most players professional right now? Well, what is it looking like, the U20s? We have maybe three professionals right now you're professional um the rest are in what they call the reserve league in, in el salvador so maybe seven or eight there's probably two in second division which mm -hmm. i you know i would say they're, they're professionals for sure yeah. um and then the the u.s guys you know a lot of them are fighting for usl minutes mm -hmm. um i have a few that are still in u19 academies uh so i think it's a good mix i don't i don't you know it's nowhere near what the u.s has right now but i um you know, we we push our guys and say, hey, make sure you're you're fighting for professional minutes. Don't settle. Um, you know, think about it if you really want to be doing U19 Academy and even college, I think, is is, is tough right now. Right. College, I think, mm -hmm. is those three month seasons maybe used to be good enough. I don't know if they're good enough anymore for a pro player. I think, you know, they, they you can start to see a, a big difference in their level. Um so you know even the college player you know is still someone who will look at because i you know there, there's good there's players in good colleges um but you know at the same time you know is, is he gonna be at the level that you know let's say a jeremy garay who's playing with Loudoun united uh you know every week starting you know right now in this tournament he's been fantastic right and i i, I attribute it to to Loudoun and dc united having a good plan for him he's training with dc united he's playing with Loudoun that helps us a lot. He brings a different experience. Um, we have a player from El Salvador who plays with Alianza, uh, a center mid who's, who's debuted with the national team a couple of times. He's 18. Um, you know, him just playing at least 15 minutes, 10, 12 minutes a, a game just gives him a, something a little bit different. So yeah, professional minutes help and, and we're getting there, but we're, we're not where we want to be. So you mentioned also all the dual nationals that, um, the dual nationals that you have there in El Salvador, a lot of Americans too. And dual nationals in soccer right now is a very hot topic in CONCACAF, right? Because it, it almost seems like we're all just a big family. It's almost like one country, uh, Central America um, and North, all together right there. A lot of Mexican Americans, El Sal uh, Salvadoran Americans, um, even like they're like, I, I believe Tejon Buchanan, he's like Jamaican and Canadian. So there's, there's like, it's, it seems like it's all one big family essentially. And here's my question to you, uh, because depending on the country you are, it's easier or harder to recruit, right? Um, Greg Berhalter, when he goes to recruit a player, it's much easier for him to be more charming than when you guys do, right? Um, yeah. United States, um, you know, we're we're the United States of America here, a bigger country. We have more resources. We're going to probably qualify to every World Cup besides 2018. Um, we're going to host 2026. That helps as well. So it's a little bit different. And he was able to recruit Serginho Dest, Yunus Musa, these players that are playing at an extremely high level. Uh, while you are recruiting uh, American players there, and uh, they're also Salvadoran. And you recently also recruited you and your dad, obviously, um, Enrico Duenas, that plays yep. um, in Netherlands. He's Dutch and so he actually never went to El Salvador, right? And you guys still you were able to recruit him. How does this recruitment process work for y'all? How 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 do you what what do you do to convince the player that's like, hey, this is this is where you should be. Is it really just calling them and making them feel? What, what do you guys plan around? I'm wondering with that sense. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, one with, with, it's a lot easier with a youth player. Um, it's a lot easier with, with the U17, U20. Um, you know, we try and watch a game, a couple games, talk to the coach, the director. I, I, I really do use the MLS filter um a lot because i think you know mls teams do a good job of scouting nowadays they have a few of them have residency programs um so i use that as a filter right i try not to 
and not to sound, you know, in a, in a negative way. Um, but it's just impossible for me to go to every club in the U S every club in Los Angeles and see a Salvadoran player. So, you know, I have to rely on, well, I'm sure LAFC has done the scouting galaxy's done their scouting. They're going to bring in the top talent. And usually that top talent will be able to compete at international, right? So that's the first step. Uh, then from there, you know, we'll, 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 we'll speak to the club and say, look, this player we've identified as Salvadoran. We'd love to speak to his, his parents, his mom, his dad, the kid. And we'll have a conversation about what our plan is for the next three, four months, right? We're going to have a camp. We'd like to bring you in. We'll do a camp in the U.S. maybe. Uh, you know, we've had a couple in the U.S., which is a lot easier. But then once bringing them to El Salvador is a different thing because you said there's some players who haven't been to El Salvador. Um, so, you know, once we bring them in, one, having coaches that also speak English, I think helps transition it easier. That's one. Two, bringing other players from the U.S. kind of creates an environment where it's safe, right? It's, it's safe mm -hmm. to say things in English. It's safe to to... You know, I'm comfortable. Oh, where are you from? From LA? Okay, I'm from the Bay Area or I'm from Virginia. Uh, and then most of the time, you know, each player, especially if he's coming from the US, each player is tapped into their culture somehow, right? Everybody knows what a pupusa is. Everybody knows some slang. I still have to try Spanish. a pupusa, actually. Yee, you're, you're late. You're late there, huh? You need one. I know. I, I actually apologize for that. I apologize, <laughs> but I do have to get to that as soon I as possible. Maybe Miami. I don't know if Miami would have one for you. I'm going to be in California. I want to go maybe try in California, maybe. LA. LA is yeah, the place. Yeah, I've heard that. So I, I'm. that's that's on my bucket list. Don't worry. I'll, I'll make sure to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so, so, so look, we, 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 that's kind of the start. Then from there, it's talking to the players. Say, what are your plans? Right. What, is, what is it that you're trying to do? Uh, there's some players you that come in, they're not ready for international level, right? I've had players that come in they're they're, they're still club players. Um, but then there's players that we say this, this kid has something, um, and we need to figure out what his plan is. So then, you know, it's having a conversation with them and we can't offer what the U S can offer. And then we can't offer what Mexico can offer. Um, but I also think that gives us sometimes a small advantage because, you know, I had a conversation with a player. I said, you're 18, right? Um, Tim Way is 22, 21, 23, one of those, you know, mm -hmm. three ages. Tim Way plays 10 years. Uh, he plays 75 caps, big caps, right? The, the main mm -hmm. events. How many caps do you get as a player, the other player, right? Even mm -hmm. if I get called into camps, even if I debut, I still have to beat Brandon Aronson. I still have to beat Tim Weah. Pulisic is still 24 years old, maybe 23 still. Uh, I have Gio Reyna, who's 18. So if I'm an offensive player who wants to break into the U.S. mold, I have a lot of players there competing. And, you know, football is is the time for a footballer is, is small. It's a small window. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one conversation we have with them is I think as a player, you always feel that I'm better than that guy. Right. And that's the correct mentality to have as a player. I'm, I'm better than him, but you can also show you're better than someone by playing against. Him. You don't mm -hmm. have to be on his team to show, oh, look, Greg, I, I'm better than him. Right. So, you know, we have that conversation with them. We don't pressure them, but we, we do tell them, you know, think about how many minutes you'll get, you know, in the next 10 years, how many World Cup qualifying games you're going to get, how many Gold Cup games you're going to get, how many Nations League games you're going to get. And then really start to see, you know, what you need for your career, right? You, you're, at a, you're at a club and the club maybe isn't playing you, but you have a good national team tournament. That's going to open up a lot of eyes, right? A lot of people are going to see you. They're going to want to make an offer for you. So, you know, I, I think is second thing is knowing the culture being able to speak to the mom and dad in, in spanish and, and having something in common you know when the player comes to El Salvador, where are your parents from uh you know la libertad ah the beach okay like we're, we're actually doing a trip to the beach you know next week when we're off for a day we're going to take you guys here so you know they get to see the country so that's kind of how we we're doing it um we're not going to hit you know our target 100 percent of the time but i i do think you know, with Mexico being so talented, the U.S. being so talented, the roster spaces are limited, right? You, there's only 26 guys that are going to the World Cup. And, you know, if your team has an average age of 23, that's most likely going to be the next World Cup team, right? So now your chance really... 
Two of me. Yeah. Right. So you're, you're talking 2030. In 2030, you know, I've, I've told the player, you're 29 years old and you're waiting for a debut. Right. And now look behind you and there's 12 Americans, 13 Americans on that, on the, on the roster. And now look at the 07 age group. Look at the 06 age group. Look at the 05 age group. There's 70 more. So it's, 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 it's kind of a time football soccer's timing. It, it's, can you hit, you know, the target at the right time, right? Can you hit it in stride? Look at Alex Rodan hits it at the right time, blows up, mm-hmm. um, you know, does it in a contract year. I mean, it, it worked out well for him. Right. So, I think, and Alex is a good story we use. He debuts at 24 with us. Um, it's a good story. He played good Gold Cup game, played against the U.S. So, I, I, you know, that's how, how we do it. But I think he really, can maybe really play important. a World Cup in 2026 if El Salvador qualifies. Correct. He's going to be in the World Still Cup. 20, 28 years old. So, so th- th- you know, those are the things that we talk about the players. You know, we were with the players today. Uh, we had a convers- we had, You know, we had a conversation just with them about 10 year plans, eight year plans, five year plans, where do you see yourself? But at the same time, you have to feel the shirt, right? And 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 even if you were in the country, if your mom's from there, your dad's from there, your grandpa's from there, um, you have to really understand that we live in a different world than El Salvador. Um, you know, I know people say, you know, they criticize the US too much. No, go to El Salvador, it's, whew, you know, you lose a game, we lose 2-0 to Mexico and we, we had a very bad game. You were, it's not the same, you know, it's a different pressure. So at the same time, you really have to be 100% committed, you know, compromiso, we call it that, right? You have to have a compromiso. You have to be committed to the shirt, to the your teammate, to the program 100% um, because there's a lot of responsibility when you put on that shirt, a lot. Yeah. Of I talked to her Gomez about this before, and he said he didn't talk about El Salvador specifically, but what he said, and I don't think he meant to bash U.S. soccer, but what he said essentially was that is he said that U.S. soccer has no pressure. That's what he was trying to say. He's like, when you compare it to other countries or he used instead of using soccer, he used footballing. If you when you compare it to other footballing nations, Mexico, El Salvador, that there's a lot of passion, Europe there's real pressure us soccer the players at least with the national team the pressure is it's it's not there it's much smaller i would say the the it, fan it, base it's just it's a different culture right over there after our game there's five you know every channel has a sports program mm-hmm. that's telling us whether we did had a good game or we had a bad game mm-hmm. and you know you can't turn on a channel without yeah somebody here you can't go on the radio in the car here in the u.s we have a bunch of accounts trying to justify bad performances in the media and then you have a crazy guy on youtube yelling at the team right here <laughs> <laughs> but that's what i mean at least you you have to log in to find that right like yeah if i if i'm in the in the car in el salvador and i i want to listen to a radio a music station the DJ will talk about how bad we play. <laughs> and it's like, ah, great. So you you change, right? And then it's the sports show talking about all the subs we got wrong and, and the wrong roster that we called up and that we should have put. So you're never, you don't ever hear the end of it, right? It takes about seven days, eight days for the country to really, really cool down. And then you can just go back to to watching TV. You know, so, you know I don't even watch the sports programs anymore because you know, they could be good, it could be bad, but, but, you know, it really, it, it, it does get to you when you hear like of all these things they're criticizing you about. And sometimes they don't even know what happened inside. Like, you know, you'll get criticized for an injured player not playing and they don't realize that he was throwing up three hours for the game. There's no way we could play him. Right. So it, it, it's different. It's a different culture. I mean, we know that. And that, that's why I told you the Hispanic culture, Salvadoran American, Mexican American, even Latino, um, go to Brazil. Yeah. I grew up there in we, Brazil. It's crazy. Yeah, no, no that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. the, that Latin culture, we know what that's like. So that's when we tell the players, when you put the shirt on, realize that your social media, if you play a bad game, is, is going to blow up and it's going to be negative. And and as soon, you know, we have players here, 17 years old, that I looked at the national team account yesterday and it's, you know, this kid's getting criticized. This kid's getting criticized and, and he's 17, right? And it's mm-hmm. it's amazing just to, to the, 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 following it gets but that's why i said it it does come with a responsibility and when they choose they have to make sure they're willing to take that on yeah uh it's something u.s soccer fans uh i think for the most part they're aware of this by now they're aware of how it is in different cultures but yeah as someone that grew up in brazil everything you said to me it's just normal i I, 
I've seen it and I have soccer players from Brazil that I'm friends with that played for Flamengo, Palmeiras, different teams, coaches. I, I, I know very well Ney Franco that coached Brazil's U-20s when Neymar was coming up. And we talked about these things. And it, it, for them, it reaches a point where they're just numb to it. It's just, yeah, I'm going to get criticized. So the ups and downs, it just become, and the ones that don't get numb to it, they just don't make it. Um, yeah. It, it kind of happens that way. But just to close up here so I don't take much more of your time, and this has been a great um, interview and talk, that parts it seems like we're just having a conversation too. 2026 is coming up. And I think this is a massive moment for CONCACAF. Uh, throughout CONCACAF's history, probably the biggest one. Because we're going to have a World Cup where the three powerhouses of CONCACAF right now, based on the World Cup qualifying, Canada, United States, and Mexico, they're going to host. So they're going to have a hosting spot. The World Cup will also be expanded. So there will be more spots in general. With that said, finally, some nations in CONCACAF that don't always have the same opportunity because they have to out beat the United States, beat Mexico to make it, they're going to have this. They're going to have yeah. this opportunity. And I know you and your dad are very much looking forward to this. And it is a strong possibility of qualifying the World Cup. How, how, how much does everything you guys are doing right now, how much of it now is focused on that? That is the end goal right now. Because that would be massive for El Salvador. No, look, it, it is massive. Um, and it, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because the the impact you make, you know, in soccer, in, in, you know, in the country as, as a national team coach, is very little right it causes a, a small ripple effect um you know we you know you listen to herdman herdman talks about the percentage of players that has to be playing in champions league european leagues to qualify for a world cup uh, i know he did a study and we've gotten some numbers off of it um you look at panama panama had 18 of, of 23 guys playing outside the country uh you look at the us now right a lot of them playing in champions league in Europe, Mexico, same thing. And, you know, for us, you know, we have two guys in MLS and we have one guy in, in Holland. And the rest are either playing USL, a couple of them, or they're playing in the league. And, you know, no matter how much, you know, Saudi, they can, they can tell us, you know, it, it can be a competitive league. It can only get you so far, right? 40 years, it hasn't gotten you there. So there has to be a change. So, you know, as much as much change as you want to make, it there's gonna to have to be a revolution in the country and fast because it needs to happen quicker, right? We're only four years away already from the next World Cup. And you know, we can do the work we're doing with the 20s now, which is huge. It's important. Um, work with the 17s. But you know, will the 22, 23 year old be the one that gets us into the World Cup, right? Make in, 26 or is it still going to be some of the guys we have now 23 year olds 24 year olds 25 year olds um and i think for that we we have to accelerate more change in the country uh i think players need to to go abroad i think players need to try their you know their luck as a foreigner in a different country having to prove themselves um and is that there has to happen there? is there resistance to that in el salvador the way you're trying to implement there's lack of there's lack of knowledge about it um you know it's very it's an ecosystem is very well protected so um you know let's say in brazil you know brazil will loan out free players because they want the player to be seen sold full right business and we're gonna use that money for the next project uh, in el salvador a free loan is is an insult it's you know we don't do free business and and it's just a a, a lack of i think understanding that this could produce something down the road and you know i've spoken to to clubs and, and agents and they tell me you know we tried to to get a loan for this guy um you know it didn't happen or you know I, we spoke to the club about this player it didn't happen or you know hey we like this player can he play defensive mid can he play what does he play you know is he is he more comfortable the right let you give him the report and then they come back to you and no oh, it didn't work out the club didn't want to loan so there is a resistance kind of to that I don't know if it's a, it's almost like, you know, give us $250,000, $300,000 for this player and we'll give them to you. And I, I think our market isn't there yet. 
um and that's that holds it back a little bit but you know we're hoping that after this CONCACAF you know qualifying round we did there was players that people liked and we're hoping, you know, players decide to make the jump or players get the opportunity to leave the jump, you know, uh, to, to make the jump. Ronald uh, Rodriguez, young center back for us, 23 years old, um, you know, signed with Tulsa. And that's great, right? I, I think it's fantastic for him. I think, um, you know, he, he came back the other day um, into the last qualifying round and, and, you know, he was in the gym an hour before every training. And I, we had never seen that from him, right? But now in, 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 in at least USL, they've given him a regimen. He's, he's, he's in, the, you know, he, he knows what he has to do. He knows how to be a pro. He sees More other guys More professionalism is the word. It, it, it's just, yeah, it's just being, being in the ultimate pro, uh, watching what he eats. You know, he lost like four kilos, right? Just in that month, he was, he was over there. So... I think right. more Let's of our guys. A lot of Americans watch this. Kilos to pounds. That's um, eight, eight pounds. pounds. Almost. Eight yeah. pounds. That's a lot. <laughs> so, you know, it's what he needed. And he's young. So we need a little bit more of that. I think the country, the league, there can be really good players there. Um, I think if more young guys get a chance in the league, I think more guys will get out. But, you know, a question we have and we have for the entire league, the country, the federate is... How fast can we accelerate this change? And, and will we have enough by 2024 um, where players are playing abroad and, and, and coming in to the national team? You know, we, we saw the Panama staff here because they're also playing in this tournament. Uh, and they did kind of the same thing we did, right? Took the men's team and they're also working with the youth teams. And, you know, we asked them, what was, what did you, you know, you had a great run. I think Christensen's a really, you know, really good coach, uh, smart guy. Um, and I asked them, I said, you know, what is it that you guys did that you feel elevated you and had you that close? And he said, our guys are playing abroad. It's that simple. And, and that's what we rely on. We rely on them playing abroad and then coming in and, and you know, knowing what it's like to be a professional, knowing what it's like uh, to train at, at a good intensity. And then they come in and, and, you know, we just have to mold it to what we we're trying to do. And I think that's key for us. Um, you know, just two guys in MLS and one guy, you know, fighting for, for, for minutes in, in, in the Dutch league. I don't know if it's, it, that's not going to be enough. I know that, right? Because Costa Rica, Costa Rica league is, when you go there, it's a great league. One, uh, very professional against the U S they start three U twenties. Yeah. Don't talk yeah. about that game. I'm just... <laughs> no, but I mean, we look at it yeah. and we go, you start three U twenties. That's their base for 26. Right, so Costa well, Rica's gonna it, be good. It's also a team that in 2014 they made it to a World Cup quarterfinals. Quarter That's finals. not a joke. Yeah, yeah that and, and they've qualified in 2018. Uh so it's I mean they produced Kaylor Navas. Um look, that's a world class player. You you look at Honduras, you know, uh Kyoto, Abrelelis, uh, Rodriguez, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these guys, even Maldonado in the back. They, they, Moya, I mean, they, they have some amazing players. Uh, Panama, I didn't expect Panama to lose against the U.S. that bad. And I also didn't expect them to tie Honduras. I thought tactically they were one of the better teams in CONCACAF. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they, they knew how to switch up their game plan. They knew how to attack you. Uh, they have, you know, good athletes. Quintero, Blackburn, uh, you know, Godoy plays in MLS. Good in Nash. I mean, so they have all Murillo. these guys that... Murillo is a uh, fantastic player. Yeah, Murillo. Uh, so, you know, all these guys, you know, I thought they, they, they'd finish stronger, but there's talent there, right? So if you look at it, it's not just because the U.S., Mexico, and Canada are in the world. You still, you're still going to have to go through Costa Rica, Honduras, Panama, Jamaica. Jamaica Antonio needs is a monster. To figure out, yeah, Jamaica needs to figure out their off-the-field issues. Um, and, because... and, and, and if they get that right, Mm -hmm. You're talking about a team that that is so difficult to handle. You know, on um, TV, on TV, you'll see them. And you'll go, okay, yeah, uh, Jamaica but... on paper, on talent, they can compete very easily with the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, if they're if they're well coached and there's no issues outside of the field, there's no reason th that the U.S., Mexico, and Canada should be able to walk over Jamaica because, like you said, Antonio, um, Leon Bailey, Ravel Morrison. Um, uh, Ethan Pinock and Liam Moore at the back. 
and then yeah. you got Taxi Lawrence on the left. That's a good. That's a very and, strong Concacaf team. Right and then you look at every game they played. They gave everybody a hard time. Mexico, yeah. U.S. You know everybody. And and I don't know if you've ever seen them on the at field level because that's one thing you know no. I've learned. Yeah, at field level they fly. You know yeah. when you're up. You know we have our tactical cam. Sometimes we'll have a coach up there. It's like they don't look that fast. It's like no, come down. You same boat style. You same boat. Cool. Style. These guys can fly. <laughs> And, and, you know, it looks like they're in fifth gear and our guys are still in second gear and you look and they're in the end line. And, and that country, man, they, they know how to make um, sprinters. Athletes. Yes, Athletes, sprinters. Yeah. They know how and, to and do look, that. You know, Anthony Robbins is kind of the same, right? Just like this. But, you know, again, so it's not, I don't think CONCACAF is going to be an easy road. I think it's going to be difficult again. And uh, I think we have to be careful to not think, okay, you know, we competed well, the three big dogs are out and we're, no, no, no. I think, you know, we have to be sure that we follow a, a right process. We do things correctly and, and we do what other countries are doing, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Players need to play abroad. There has to be a good percentage of players that are playing in, in, in you know, outside the league. Um, and then you have to find the right balance. But I, I hopefully we can get to that point um, because I think, I think in, in, in 10 years, if we continue following this path, I think El Salvador can be a Costa Rica and Honduras, um, you know, in CONCACAF. And that, that's, I think, what the country needs. Yeah. Also, we'll help you all get more money into the country for soccer to improve the league infrastructure. And then everything just starts to flow better after that. But, yeah. yes, first of all, I want to thank you very much for taking almost an hour to be here with us here in the channel people are gonna everyone's gonna love this episode i loved it it was a nice conversation no uh, no no anytime man also wishing the best of luck to you and hugo perez your father and el salvador except for when you face the united states okay um, then i can't wish you we best need a of result luck. In, in june for sure i can't i mean <laughs> i mean i can't i sorry at that part i can't be on your side but sure go beat <laughs> granada go destroy granada but united states i gotta go i gotta back the U.S. men's national team and the boys there. But regardless, thank you very much for coming along. No, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, always, uh, you know, happy to chat. Uh, soccer. I think tactical manager, I expected more of a tactical talk. You know, I think we have to get into that one day. One day we will. Sometimes we talk, we can talk a little bit about Greg Berhalter's tactics. The problem is if we're going to break this down today, you're going to face him in a month or so, um, two months. You, you know, if I didn't play him, I would have, broken it down a little bit more but yeah so, so let's after, do this after. let's do this we can't do this we can't do this until nations league is over so that's going to be for 2023 2023 because then you won't face the u.s for a while because they won't be on qualifiers we'll bring you along and then you can break down the games that you guys face and that, that'll actually be lots of fun because then i'll also give you my perspective and i'll make sure to study that game a little bit more um and that'll be fun so do you have a deal there Let's do it. And I'll, we'll give you, you know, we'll show you kind of images and clips that we use for the players so they can see that I'm way. I'm going to get copyrighted. I, I, look, I'll tell you the <laughs> truth. I, I think, you know, coaches in the country need more of that. You know, I, you, there, it's a vacuum of information. You're starving for that information as a young coach, like trying to see what, what teams do. And, and there's very little because everybody's very mm -hmm. secretive. So they don't want to, but I, I think to develop more coaches, I've had this conversation with a lot of guys, uh, you know, you need to see more of, of the tactical cam stuff, the zones that you attack and, 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 you know, things that coaches, I think yearn for, right. When you're finally looking at champions league game, you see a game breakdown and analysis. So I think it'd be fun to do that. I, I still tell people, I think we should see more of that. I'm down for it next year after you're not playing the United States for a while. Jason, okay. thank you very okay. much. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Huh?